let's get to the evaluation of a swap. And up to this point, I think that, uh, that the first method of valuation we get to should be pretty obvious. Um, remember we said that on day one, when we enter into a swap, that the value of the swap is basically zero. Uh, it's not exactly zero, but it's close enough to zero. It's as close to zero as you're going to get, if not zero. Uh, there just might be some a uh, few dollars either way, depending on on uh, the the time, the the actual day, etc. But let's figure out how we value these things once we move away from day one. We can value them two ways, uh, and whichever way you want to take depends on whichever way you prefer. And number one, we can value them in terms of two bonds, so that the value of the swap is equal to the value of the fixed rate bond minus the value of the floating rate bond at any point in time. And we would value it this way if we were long the fixed, that's why we have a, an implied plus sign in front of it, and you see the negative sign in front of the floating rate bond, we're short the floating rate. So this is for the LIBOR payer. If it were the other way around, if we were long the floating rate bond and short the fixed, the value of the swap would be the floating rate bond minus the fixed rate bond. Now. These are mirror images of each other that if the value for the swap um, for the LIBOR payer is, let's say, plus 1 million, uh, we don't have to calculate the other one. It'll just be negative 1 million. Uh, you'll remember that one of the basic definitions of a derivative, of all derivatives, is that they are zero-sum games. They are not creators of wealth. They are transfers of wealth. So it doesn't matter which approach you take. You can value the swap in terms of the LIBOR payer or in terms of the fixed rate payer. Um, and they're just, if one is positive, the other just happens to be negative. That's all. So how do we do this? Well, recall valuing a fixed rate bond is fairly straightforward. We're going to take the present value of the stream of payments and the last payment will include the future value of the bond or the par value of the bond. So we take the present value of all the payments discounted at the appropriate zero rate for maturities of whatever it is. So if this is the first payment in six months, we need a zero rate, a six month zero rate. If this is the payment in one year, we need a 12 month zero rate, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to the final um, payment date and we find the present value of that and there you go that's the value of a fixed rate bond it couldn't be more straightforward uh, we've already done this uh, so if you're valuing the fixed rate bond very straightforward the floating rate one actually is even easier but can be extremely confusing so I'm gonna try to break it down as best I can for you here as of a payment date once we get to a payment date, let's say that uh, it's at T star and the payment is K star. The moment we pay, the, the split second after we pay, the bond is worth its face value. The bond is worth L, let's say. It's whatever the notional principle involved in the swap is. If it's 100 million or 10 million or whatever the case is, it is worth L. Why? Because it is priced based the next payment will be discounted back at the discount rate. The discount rate and the coupon rate are the same thing. So at this point in time, the net present value of all future payments will be L, will be par. So we already know that once we reach a payment date, once we pay a coupon, anything forward we don't have to discount back, it is just par. The moment before the payment is made, it is the notional principal plus whatever interest that we owe. But we've got to get that back to the valuation date. So all we have to figure out is, well, what was the LIBOR rate that we observed before the payment date? What was that LIBOR rate? How much is the payment going to be on that date? And then we just discounted backwards. We discounted by e to the negative, or we divide by e to the positive, e to the r, asterisk t, asterisk t is this period of time, and r is the LIBOR or swap zero rate for a maturity of t star. And we will discount that back to this point in time. So that's all we have to do when we value a floating rate bond is say, well, there's only one payment. We just have to go to the next payment date, 
figure out what the notional principal is plus the payment that should be made and discount that back to today. We don't have to go further. Why? Because the notional principal, as soon as that interest payment is made, the fair value of that bond is its notional principal. So the notional principal represents the net present value of all future cash flows as of this day. So we've already done it. It's already in the price, in other words. So we just have to discount back one period. So once we value the fixed rate bond, and once we value the floating rate bond, well, it's just simple subtraction. Let's have a look at how that's done. So we're going to value a, uh, a swap. Uh, and this is the setup we're going to make. Let's say that we have a financial institution that's uh, on one side of a swap, the notional amount of 100 million. It is the LIBOR payer. It will pay six month LIBOR. And as a party to the swap, it will receive the fixed rate of 8% per annum uh, um, uh, per year, paid, of course, semi-annually. So because it's receiving this and paying LIBOR, we say it is long the fixed and short the floating. So the value of the swap in this particular instance for this side of the, of the uh, swap is the value of the fixed rate bond of which it's long minus the value of the floating rate bond of which it's short and the negative sign is in front of the floating rate bond. That's how you can sort of keep it straight. So when we look at this, I can ask if I say right away, what's the short, uh, uh, what side are they short? You can look at it and say, well, the negative side's in front of the floating rate bond, they're the LIBOR payer. There we go. There's one and a quarter years left, and well, it pays uh, interest uh, every every six months. So what we'll do is we'll draw out our timeline from zero onwards. I, I, I find the timeline helps keep everything straight. And at 15 months, that'll be our last payment that needs to be made. So we'll go back six months to nine months, go back another six months to three months. So from today, our first coupon payment is three months out, then nine months, then 15 months which means that our last observance of LIBOR would have been three months ago. So we're going to need a LIBOR rate from three months ago. And we're told a lot more information uh, in the setup of the question. We're told that LIBOR observed back then was 10.2%. So we have that. And we're also told the rates. We don't have to figure them out, which is nice. When you do the questions at the back of the chapter, you pretty much have to figure out your own LIBOR rates, which is, you know, gives you good practice, but this is all given to us here. This one is 10.5% and we have 11%. So this right here is our LIBOR. And remember, all LIBOR rates are with continuous compounding. So all of this is, is in. On our fixed rate bond, what do we have? So we're gonna value a floating rate bond and we're gonna value a fixed rate bond. And so let's set up our cash flows. On our fixed rate bond, uh, it's an 8% um, paid semi-annual. So we have four, four, and since this is maturity, we're gonna say we're gonna get the full face value back 104. Notice I'm just pricing it out on the 100 point system. It's pretty much the easiest way to price out all bonds. So we're going to find the net present value of this cash flow discounted at the three month rate. We're going to find the net present value of this cash flow discounted at the nine month, uh, um, the LIBOR rate or the LIBOR rate for that period of time. And we're gonna discount this back and simply sum them up and we'll have the value of our fixed rate bond. So when we discount back, remember what we're doing is we're multiplying by, and we'll uh, write it up here, we're multiplying by E to the negative RT. So being that we're multiplying everything by e to the negative rt to get it back, we can figure out what all of those uh, what all of those are. So e to the negative rt. Here's your negative r. Here's your t. We can figure. We can just do the math on this. You'll get a discount factor of 97.53. Here you'll get 0.9243. Here you get 0.8715. So now we have our cash flows for our fixed rate bond. We have our discount factors, e to the negative rt. All we need now is the value of our floating rate bond. So our floating rate bond, we're told we have 10.2 here. So all we have to do is take the 100 million, multiply by 10.2, 
and multiply it by half a year, the six months. Remember, we are ignoring the day count conventions in all of our examples. Typically, you would want to know how many days this is, and it would be the number of days over, what is it? Actual over 360, so the number of days over 360. So if you multiply this out, we will get 105.1. 105.1 and we just want to discount that back to that period of time as well. So 105.1 times 0.9753 we'll discount that back we'll get 102.505 so just the 105 times the 0.9753 which is the same as 105.1 times e to the negative rt. We've just already figured out e to the negative rt. There's the value uh, of our uh, floating rate bond, or let's just write it out so that, uh, that we know what this is. This is BFL, uh, this right here. So now we just have to figure out the fixed component. And to do that, the 4 multiplied by the discount factor of 97 uh, 0.53 is the same as saying 4 to the e negative rt because we've already figured that out. I just want to be clear so that uh, I don't jump over any steps along the way. You know exactly how I'm getting every number. This will be 3.901. This 4 will be discounted at this zero rate. e to the negative rt here is 92, uh, 0.9243 times 4 will give us 3.697. And here, because we're valuing two bonds, we're, we're discounting the, the um, payment plus the future value all the way back using just this discount rate, 8715. We'll get 90.64. Adding them all together gives us 98.238. This is BFIX, which is this value here. So all that's really left is to substitute those amounts in. So we'll get 98.238 minus 102.505 equals negative 4 point, whoops, let's get that in there, 0.267 million. So the value for or the financial institution of the swap is negative 4.267 million. So whoever's on the other side of the swap would have a value of positive 4.267 million. There we go. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, the questions are always straightforward in the, or the examples are always straightforward. Once you get to the questions, yeah, it gets a little, uh, it gets a little tricky. But let me give you uh, something to keep in mind. You need certain things here. You need the cash flows for the fixed rate bond. Uh, let me start at the very beginning. Draw a timeline. Draw a timeline of the scenario that, that, that you have. It will always help if you draw a timeline of the scenario as opposed to try to see it in your head and solve the problem in your head. Just draw a line and put out where the payments are. On the bottom of the line, I always put my fixed, uh, my fixed rate bond and I put the cash flows and I discount them back. On the top of the line, I'll put my zero rates first. I'll get my zero rates. Then I'll just put my discount factors right on top of that so I have it. I don't. Once I calculate it once, I don't have to worry about making calculator errors in several times that I'm doing it. Then I want to find just the first at the first uh, payment date um, what the what the uh, um, floating rate bond will be, and then I've already got the discount factor. So once I have my fixed rate cash flows. Once I have my discount factors, and once I have my floating rate uh, cash flow, all that's left is just discounting it back and doing the math.